Good morning all. So I think I'll start with introducing a few people. Emma Jungham is a, the watch officer with UNICEF and the team leader for this proposal that we are making to UNICEF for menstrual hygiene management in Ghana. So she is based in Kamale, but because of this project, she has had to be trekking up and down between Kamale and Accra. So Emma, you are welcome to the Institute of African Studies. I say Dua Yobo Ado is. Is it Ado Yobo? Ado Yobo is a country national coordinator of FAWI. And you should be familiar with FAWI because our own ATC is the national chairman, chairperson of FAWI. And so she's also a member of the, the Ghana team. You already know me because I am here. <laughs> yeah. And uh, on the African studies side of the research, we have built a team to look at it. Uh, Professor Awedoba, you already know, he's a medical anthropologist. He's a member of the, of the research team that we are building up in, in the Institute of African Studies. Dr. Usman, our person is also a member of the team. We need his expertise in demography and research. Uh, you know, he teaches research. In the okay. I just saw Promise come in. Promise is over there. He's a young man who is doing a lot of the leg work for us on the team. Others will be coming in later Dr. Atugra and Dr. Kwanza. One of the assignments we have is to do a presentation on gender in uh, menstrual health hygiene management. We'll be using MHM most of the time, but MHM stands for Menstrual Hygiene Management. And it's a project that is going to run in many countries across the world. So it's not just Ghana and not just Africa, but in other places, India, uh, Kyrgyzstan, Niger, Nigeria, and a few other places. So even though this is a presentation, we are, we are looking for, you for reactions from you, questions, comments, input, so that we can make a better proposal to UNICEF. So we are looking at how we factor gender into the that is gender. It is not based on your sex. I mean it's not based because a man could be a very good cook like me. Yeah. And a woman could be the breadwinner in the cosmopolitan mix in urban areas. Things seem to calm down. The people tend to ignore the myths that they would have come with from their villages because they are now far away from there. So the deities of the village have no, no power on them in the urban area. So there's a cooling down of the myths and prohibitions and the taboos. But in the rural areas, these are more in effect. So you find 90% of girls feeling shame. Then boys tease menstruating girls. And all these statistics come from what are the menstrual hygiene matters. So why do we need gender in MHM program? That's for more effective and sustainable WASH program. So if we do gender mainstreaming in the WASH program, then they will, they will be more effective and they will last longer. Because if we provide the facilities and we don't factor in gender, then they are of no use to the girls. Then the girls will not use them. Then the whole purpose of the WASH program would have been destroyed. There are more targeted services that meet the different watch needs of boys and girls. That's what I was talking about, like provision of pains and provision of running water, or at least water, provision of uh, receptacles that can be used by the girls. Uh, what's the 
the term is popularly called mokta. For lack of a, an English term, we might call them kettles. It's a kettle. Kettles, yes. Uh, you know, in Islamic areas, they need those things to wash. They already have a culture of washing, but they need the receptacle. If it's just running water, it's going to be very difficult for the girl to, to use the running water. But with the receptacles that they can fetch the water with and wash it to be easier. So those are things that need to be factored in. And then a strategic, uh, a more efficient approach by maximizing the contributions that both boys and girls can make to wash program. This shouldn't be a top-down approach to implementing wash. The ideas that the boys and the girls have should be factored in because it is the girls who are going to be the users and the, of course the boys. So what are their ideas? What do they really want? It is not us sitting in our air conditioning offices who should decide that this is what the girls need. We need to know what do they need. When they, when they have the, the situation, what do they need? How do they want it to be solved? And then that will be factored in to add to the ideas that already exist. That will bring up a more holistic way of solving the problem. And then a strategic opportunity to promote gender relations, relationships that improve equity between boys and girls and within schools, families, communities, and societies. There's more of advocacy, trying to get to the communities, to the boys, to let them understand what menstrual hygiene management is, what menstruation is, so that they, they will understand the girls when they are in the situation. And so for communities to also understand and probably begin to change some of the uh, myths and the taboos that are very uh, inimical to the welfare of girls. Okay. We come to the model that we are creating for Ghana. Um, we have six pillars, we call them the pillars. You know, the pillar of the building is what holds the building. So these are going to be the pillars for um, the menstrual hygiene management program in Ghana. And uh, pillar one is creating an enabling environment. And this translates into policy and advocacy. So we need to have good strategies, policy strategies, so that such a program can be well implemented. And then, of course, we have to have advocacy. We need to go out there and confront the problem and try to address the problem, get people into our way of thinking. And so we have to raise political, the political profile of the problem. Then commitments for financing NHM at all levels, because everything translates into money. If you make a policy and you don't fund it, you don't put the money to run the policy, it is going to be a failed policy. So if we have a policy to have a work program in every school in Ghana, and then we don't budget for it, then what will be the point? Who is supposed to now do it? So that, and that of course, needs what? Political commitment, political will, to be able to do this at all levels. Then pillar two is a set of common image and principles. So the cultural, socio-cultural norms and value systems, supernatural beliefs, uh, say menstruation is normal for girls, as wet dreams is for boys. Menstruation is normal. In the same way that girls have menstruation, boys get wet dreams. So what are the taboos and the myths about wet dreams? Who, who teaches boys because of wet dreams? It's a natural thing. You don't even know when it happens. The boy is asleep and it happens. And so it's taken as normal. So why is it that the menstruating of girls will be teased? It's also a normal. It's even more normal than, than the boys. A girl cannot avoid it. Boys probably can go through their lives without having a wet dream. See, So it's even more normal than that for boys. Okay. So what we need to do then is to have a kind of common norm to address, to approach this. So that if everybody understands that, we have go out there, let people understand that. Look, menstruating of girls is a normal thing 
just as we have for every, every other biological function that every human being undergoes. Then we have that common norm, which will probably replace all the taboos and myths concerning menstruation that already exist in the society. This is not going to be a confrontational thing. It's going to be a gradual process of attitude, attitudinal change, or some of the words. Okay. Then pillar three is the delivery mechanisms. Okay, you have your, your goals, you have your set principles, your program. How do you deliver it? And one of them is the Wash in Schools programs, W-O-I-N-S. That's the Wash in School program. And then uh, the PPP, and what's that one again? Public policy, Public policy planning. planning. Then health promotion. In fact, uh, if this is to succeed, we need the health people. You know, in most of the rural areas, the health, the ones that are more visible are the community health nurses. See? And so, and they are people that talk to the women and they talk to the community people. They are well regarded in the community. So one of the ways to succeed in a program like this is to hook the health people in and have very good policies concerning them. What are they to do? Are they only to go and weigh children? Or they are supposed to talk to the women, talk to the girls about these things, teach the women so that the women can teach their daughters. And then, an active program of getting language change. It is the way we use language sometimes, and the kind of terminology that we use, as we were already saying, was slow and whatnot. The science teacher would have used such a term and therefore the boys will pick it up and apply it to the girls. So language use, it's not language as in the kind of language you speak, but language as in the kind of sarcasm that you can bring into your language when you are. Teachers sometimes do it without being aware of it. Oh, the girls and that their thing, then the boys will laugh. And if teacher thinks that it is funny, the boys will of course think that it is funny, and so they will pick it up. So we have to be mindful of language when we are talking of these things. Pillar four is capacity building. So the target is training, MHM working groups all at all levels. So we need to have people who are working in this sector at all levels of the country, of, at all levels of the schooling system, since the particular target is school girls. And then the school setup, the teachers, the um, what do they say? Supervisors. supervisors, girls, education units, and one of shared PTAs. All the school units need to be involved in this because these are the groups that actually manage the schools. These are the groups that monitor the way things work in the school. These are the groups that do the evaluation. These are the groups that in the end would impact on the kind of policies that will be made. And so all of these people need to be a part of getting this program to succeed. So that's the training. And so they need to be trained in what MHM means and how to set about implementing good MHM practices in schools. Then of course, the religious leaders and the traditional leaders cannot be left out because Particularly religious and traditional leaders are behind some of the myths and the taboos that exist in the societies. Because if they understand, if a religious leader understands that, look, menstruation is just a, a normal bodily function, and so they don't preach to make women feel uncomfortable, women are not barred from the prayer place when they are in their menses, then it will go a long way to changing the attitude of the society. Uh, we had a good example from uh, Edwin the other day who talked about his church and how they begin to train the young girls and the young boys in menstrual hygiene management from the time that they get to 12 years old. They begin to talk to them to try and get the boys to understand what it means, try and get the girls to understand what are the changes that are going to occur 
to them when they approach menash. That's the first time of menstruation. So that they know exactly what is going to happen to them, the bodily changes that will happen. And the boys also understand that. So that is one of the ways that uh, training in religious, the training of religious leaders would. So if we could get leaders from all the religious groups, leaders from traditional groups, and train them, and then they go back out there to their communities, gradually to be like chipping away at the rock, we'll finally get everybody to be on the same page. Pillar five is financing. We already mentioned it in passing. Gender sensitive budgeting, the inclusion of sanitary parts in preparation of state. Uh, state is school, school what? Uh, school performance, performance improvement right. program. And so this is a, a report that comes up. I don't know, this is a program where you look at what you need to improve performance in your school. And if girls are not coming to school because of their nurses, and you think that providing sanitary pads is what is going to help them to come to school and stay in school and to help in improving performance in the school, then by all means, you should include it in the budget. Not that you are supplying them the sanitary pads all the time, but at least you should provide them to be there in an emergency because the girl may not know when it will happen. But if she's comfortable that, oh, when it happens, there will be sanitary pads in the school, she will feel more comfortable to come to school. But many schools don't factor that in. And beyond the school level, even at the national level, when, let's say, the Ministry of Education or Ghana Education Service is doing its yearly budgeting, should they not budget for MHM programs in schools. If they budget for it, if the central government doesn't give all of that money, at least something will be given, which will enable them to start a, a kind of program. So we, we need to have this at the back of our minds when we are doing budgets to factor in for the girls in school. And then pillar six is monitoring and evaluation. Monitoring needs to be a regular thing and one of the ways to do it is to get reports from the secu supervisors. You know secu supervisors do their reports with the district and regional, then the districts will use do their reports. It will go to the regional, regional will use to do their reports and then these are sent in a quarterly, uh, quarterly to headquarters. At the end of the year the education uh, management information systems will come out with their report. So that one, Ernest is a yearly report, but these other ones from the regions, they are quarterly reports. So it will be easy to monitor and do an evaluation of these programs from these reports. So if you want a more regular report, you can do a quarterly one every three months from the reports that come from the regions, and then you can get a yearly one from Ennis. Okay, so coming near the end, how far has Ghana gone? The policy environment. The National Watch Standards and Implementation Guidelines for Child Friendly School Programming Development contains evidence based standards and guidelines on infrastructure. UNICEF is already running the WASH program and has come up with what the standards are. It's just that, of course, it, is, it doesn't cover the whole country, so we still need, there's still a lot of work to be done to cover the whole country. Two regions, uh, two districts of five regions is not enough. It, it helps, but there's still a lot to be done. So we have started, but we still have a long journey ahead of us. And in 2013, a consultant was recruited to carry out a gender assessment of washing schools and develop gender mainstreaming guidelines. So that's another step forward. So it's not just about providing the facilities, uh, starting the program. Now there is a consultant that to study the program and make sure that there's gender mainstreaming, which is very important. Okay. So it's not just a facility, equality, okay, there are facilities for boys and facilities for girls. 
how suitable are the facilities for the girls? That's what the consultant is going to uh, is doing. When in school, watching school program in Ghana, Kevin Fred runs in uh, senior high schools, SHF and SHCs. School health plan. School health, uh, okay, of which MHM is part. So that's why we already have these things running. It's just that there is no, there's no full coverage. And the day that we'll be having, we'll have 100% coverage of schools, then we'll say hallelujah. We have done well. So that's how far Ghana has gone. And we need to start changing the stereotypes. Now we have ladies' football, ladies are going into boxing. We have a lot of lady mechanics, very good ones too. Okay. So it's no longer the era where we say women don't do this kind of work, women don't do that. Hey, why are you playing football? You are a girl, go and sit down. And when I was growing up, that was the situation. We would never allow a girl to play football with us. And a boy would never be allowed to play and play. Okay? Because there were stereotypes, those stereotypes existed. Boys do this, girls do that. But things need to change. They are changing slowly. Of course, every culture is a dynamic and it changes, but they are changing slowly. And so encourage your young brothers in the house, washing of dishes and cooking in the kitchen. It's not just reserved for women. The nice thing about you, a man learning to cook, is that you can decide what to cook. Then you won't have to eat anything that your wife prepares for you. That is a, a, an advantage. So encourage them. So we we'll begin to change the stereotypes. Thank you. Okay. So we we'll open the floor for comments. Additional things that we could add to this to make a better proposal. Some of the things that we can consider in, in our proposal. Yeah, Dr. Yeah. Small. Thank you very much for an exciting and uh, a bit exhaustive uh, presentation. Uh, two issues. Uh, the first is about the relationship of uh, menstrual management in school and general community levels. Sabunzongo is in Greater Accra, and I'm sure Greater Accra is one of the areas that is piloting the WASH programs. Uh, there are two schools, I think, uh, it's in Sabunzongo, I should advise uh, uh, Latabi Okoshi 2 and 3 basic schools. And even as they're doing well with the WASH program, water is a big problem. And so, in doing this, maybe we might also be looking at, in local areas, how we would be able to change the situation. What I'm saying is that, in general, water is difficult to get. And some of the successes of these programs hinge on the underlying conditions of communities. You know, so that's a problem, and, and we should look out for this. And it's not only menstrual health management, it's also other programs. Uh, the second is uh, about, I saw in your framework about the pillars, the framework for areas of concern. And I was surprised that in the first of our policy, by the way, did you say PPP was, I know it to be public private partnership. Yes. That's it. Yes. Okay, so PPP is yes. public. Okay. Okay. So uh, back to the, the framework, that's the policy, the pillar. And you see the first one, we stress so much on policy direction. And we've done that always for some programs. And then later on, in the Pillar 4, you now bring traditional opinion leaders and other key stakeholders only when it's about capacity building. And, and over and over again, I think we've learned lessons that programs sometimes don't succeed because they start off as a policy orientation. We craft whatever we want about it, and we only get to key stakeholders when we talk of capacity building. And when you talk of capacity building, it's about strengthening what they already know. What of taking from them what their input is when you are designing a program like this? 
and that should feed into the policy and not wait until when you're doing capacity. Because often, we know that capacity is just transferring some kind of skills. Of course, you learn from them. Right like we have a set of tools that we are bringing, a toolkit that we want it to fit, and that's good enough. But I think that for many programs, and especially my experience with WASH, the fact that we need to also change the orientation. Well, right from policy input, we are seeking the, 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 the viewpoints and the opinions of all these key stakeholders, whether they are religious leaders, they are traditional leaders, they are youth leaders, even including women's groups because of the cultural thing. So what I find is it's a good thing, but I'm not too comfortable seeing capacity building only the one where down there we now mention these key stakeholders. And then in policy, it's all like, you know, the top-down thing, technocratic thing, where we design it and we only involve these people when we are actually going to implement the program. Okay. So that's why. So you suggest a reordering of the... Yeah, yeah, even not so. If you go back to Pillar 1, mm -hmm. if, you go, if you go back to Pillar 1, that's the back. Uh -huh. You see, there, exactly. Mm -hmm. You see, there, target policy makers and decision makers. You see, okay. so it so needs to be elaborated, exactly. Because at the top, we've just put the, a policy environment and we've only looked at strategies and policies. You know, it is not as clear here. Because you also put the policy makers and maybe decision makers or implementers. You know, so it needs to be elaborated. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. We're just going to overlook them. It's for the lack of space. We're trying to fill it in. So they definitely, with the mother jazz and uh, all of them. Thank you so much. Yeah, Prof. Yeah, also for related to this, is the question of uh, cultural sensitivity. I know that the company is back. I think I'm excited for the cultural sensitivity. I'm just wondering the extent to which you've factored all this into this program because sometimes we have made a point that there are differences if you look from one sort of country to the other in the school. But it's also important for us to understand maybe why people do things the way they do them. When we are armed with that kind of knowledge, then we can intervene better. Sometimes the solution to a problem is inside the system itself. So if the solution is there, we don't necessarily have to invent a new solution or bring a solution from outside. It's just a question of going down there, picking that and presenting it to the people and telling them, look, this is what you yourselves consider as a way forward. So why can't we do this? Okay. Now one of my favorite examples has always been this is of <laughs> it came up yes, with uh, a solution by accident the papers. And the solution exactly matched to what I had in mind about cultural sensitivity. Understanding what it is that we're talking about. What are the local concerns? And once you once you got that, who are the stakeholders? Okay? How can we address their concerns? If you're able to do all, all of these things, then you've solved the problem. In this case, they just decided that, well, if uh, it is an issue that parents are concerned about, traditional <laughs> leaders are concerned about, because they think that there are going to be certain sanctions, religious sanctions, as a result of these things not being done, then what can we do? Traditional, what do you do with these things? Okay, and they found that yes, there is a solution. So it's okay, then let's use a local solution uh, for this kind of thing, and they did it. It's okay, what are some of the other stakeholders? What are their concerns also? Young men who want wives. What exactly do they want in a woman? That uh, female genital mutilation and associated practice of being survived. So you know what they want. So you, you need to those concerns. What about parents? What about the girls themselves? So at the end of the day, you've got a situation where you can talk about a win-win situation. Everybody ends up as a winner. Nobody is a loser. So many programs need to factor in some of these things. I mean, when you, you take an adversarial position, outside, I mean, you're coming from outside, everything inside is negative. Now, maybe that is part of the problem because you, you bring in a, a create a kind of antagonism which is going to spoil your program. But if you are willing to understand the people, their concerns, 
maybe there's a solution to a problem even in there. I just wanted to ask for his suggestion. At this stage, we haven't started the research work. We're going to design it. So what can we do concretely to factor this in? Well, it appears to me that uh, the solution is to understand some of the neurons themselves. Mm -hmm. One, it is true that the nose differ from area to area. Now, in this country, what people often do is this. They listen to the read the newspaper. The newspaper says something. So they say, okay, this is terrible. We must go to Parliament to pass a law to criminalize it. Yeah, but then you see, maybe, you see, the, the context that the newspaper man is uh, presenting is, is horrible. Maybe the same thing happens somewhere else, and nobody sees that it's a problem to anyone. So your law is not going to criminalize something which people don't see that it creates any problem in any way at all to anyone, and it probably doesn't. In fact, your, the opposite is when you intervene and stop it, then you bring it into the fore, other kinds of problems. So with this kind of thing, maybe we need to understand what the practices are, okay? Uh, Ghan knows about the administration, the same as the human knows, and so on and so forth. Now we just realized that the Syrian community, the Muslim communities, for example, already are used to this idea of carrying a book of water after doing their own thing to uh, so on and so forth. So maybe in that kind of community, half your work is done. It's easier to persuade people to do what to do something which is needed to what they are already doing. So maybe we need to understand a little bit more about what is happening. And once we know what is happening, we need to go a little bit further and understand why it is that people do these things. Okay? Is it just for the fun of it? Is it a religious reason? And so on and so forth. If there are no religious considerations, then we can easily persuade them, well, if the options, these are two options, why don't you move this way? Because you gain this way. If you remain this way, these are the handicaps. Sometimes we have to ed also educate the local people about the consequences of the, some of the things they do. Yeah. Because we need to persuade them that what they are doing is necessarily a helpful. And we have to be very careful that we do not, more or less, miseducate them. We do not overemphasize some of the negativities, you see. Yeah, because if you go to a community and you tell them that, oh, you see, female gen I mean, genital mutilation will bring up all, all this and so on and so forth. Maybe if you go to certain context, certain cultural context, the kinds of female genital mutilation practices they have bring about that. But if in this community it doesn't have that kind of thing. So if you try to bring in that kind of information, then of course you don't persuade people because they know in their context, this kind of thing is rare, it doesn't even happen. So maybe you need to understand the differences to begin with. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Yeah. So, just um, one more time, uh, thank you very much for your very uh, erudite presentation. Um, my first question relates to the MHM. I, my understanding is say it's what? Menstrual hygiene. Oh, okay. I thought it was a health thing because I was going to ask if, if it was such a natural thing, why is it related to health? But then that's also. But the second issue relates to you do recall that a few months, or if not even a year or so back, the government said that they were going to budget some money, 15 million or something, to secure parts for various schools for. And there were a whole lot of full about about that. I'm asking. Uh, some of the issues that came out of that proposal from government was that then for some of the very poor ones, uh, parts alone might not be sufficient. And that perhaps parts to even hold the parts in place uh, were, were even then necessary. And possibly even, um, even painkillers to relieve those who undergo uh, serious pains were equally important. Have you? Factored some of these things because indeed they are real. I don't know what to think. <laughs> well, this is a politically charged question. We we'll attempt to, I think that's the whole reason for this exercise we are doing. Why that program probably failed was because it wasn't based on any baseline research. 
And so UNICEF seeks to do things the proper way by doing a, a formative research first, find out what is on the ground, what the situation is, what the girls go through, what do they want, before you will then try to implement any program. And of course, there's also there's going to be a piloting of reusable sanitary pads so that the, the, the economic situation of girls' inability to have access to pads will be somehow solved. So that's just a simple Ebola problem will add to that. I think it's okay if we also want to uh, address this issue from health uh, perspectives because um, if the girls do not keep uh, proper hygiene during their periods, they, they become very prone to infection. And sometimes it doesn't show immediately, but then in later life, um, they begin to suffer the consequences of infection in their reproductive uh, lives and so on and so forth. So there are health dimensions. Of course, we could even broaden it to look at the um, social health and then psychological health. If, if they suffer stigma and discrimination, if they are not able to um, integrate socially, that also is exclusion and then it could result to um, all kinds of social issues and psychological issues, distress and so on and so forth. For the girls. So it, it really does have health implications with a material inside. You can remove the material, wash it, dry it, yeah. refold it, and, and put it back in the pouch and use again. Much all of you. Yeah. Okay. I don't know whether I observed right, but mm -hmm. uh, I was looking at the body language when the reusable pads <laughs> came up. I, you know, I realized something. <laughs> <people. laughs> Can you please tell me? I mean, what you think about it? This is something we are piloting. So, can you get your views, your points? So that the reusable pads to be I'm told that uh, I think some people have tried it. You are given four, and that will take you through the year. You know, so, yes, yourself. And then you are just like the Amon Singh, we give you pass. But this is a, a refined version. Yes. So, but uh, fortunately, uh, I see a guy is here. She's from Fawi, and they carried out the research on the reusable pads. They came up with the idea, so she can tell you a lot about it. The, the idea, or what we normally hear is part. So what we are used to is that uh, material. Uh, like cotton or that, that, but the part issue is a crop. It's like a crop. And the uh, research power did. Uh, we realize that some people don't even go to school because they are menstruating, because of the girls. If you should stay in yourself in the classroom, <laughs> and I say you die for this. The girls, the boys will walk at you. And you wouldn't even know how to even walk out <laughs> and go home, you see. So, how I came out, out, out with uh, uh, some, some, something to hold the material in place. It's like, if you know a tea bandage, uh, it is, we sew it ourselves, and then the inside, the under parts, is lined with uh, something like polythene. Nature, so you will never saw yourself, but you can use any material inside. It's like a pocket. Pocket is formed under, and then there are strings here which you can tie before you put on your panties. So you can use any material inside, and uh, it can hold this re reusable part in place so that it doesn't shift when you are walking. Or run because you may have to run even when you are you are in your period. You may have to do P. Yes, we go for P. So if the thing is not secured, please, 
it may shift and it can even fall. And you wouldn't know how to hold it with this voice around. <laughs> so the whole thing is that because it's a pouch with a material inside, you can remove the material, wash it, dry it, yeah. refold it, and really put it back in the pouch and use again. Okay, mine is a suggestion and something with the um, idea of the reusable part. Then I think we have to also educate the girls on how to wash them and dry them because this blood we are talking about and there are flying organisms all around that can uh, breed on even dead blood and everything. So I think we should reconsider how to wash them, what detergent they should use and everything so that it doesn't become a bad thing for them that will add on to their problem and stuff like that. I realized from the presentation, percentages that were quoted as to the number of girls who doesn't come to school due to menstrua menstruation. And when Madame was talking, she also mentioned that. And I realized that there's the general perception that we don't come to school because of the menstruation, as in staining ourselves, etc. But one main issue accounting for us not coming to school is the menstrual cramps is the pain not because we don't have pad so even if you give me a pad and i come to school i can't withstand the pain sometimes me like this when i came to university it was the same problem when you when you are in the lecture hall you end up not listening to anything so at the end of the day you prefer to stay home so how do we solve that problem? Is there any way that girls could be helped in that regard? Because I'm still working and I spend every four, four days out of every month not coming to work because of that. So it's a very big issue. And the stigmatization problem. It's a big issue when the guys laugh at us. And even in modern day, they are doing it. And I was wondering, is there any way this could be factored into social studies? Because these days we don't study life skills. So could the guys be educated in school? Because we seem to follow the things we are taught in the classroom. In the house, we, 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 we use different buckets. My brother said, no, this one is for the girls. <laughs> this bathhouse is for the girls because they menstruate and we don't and they make the buckets dirty. But when you look at the buckets, it's the same color, it's not dirty. <laughs> so is there any way this issue could be factored into your policy, into social studies? All right, let's hear from the boy. <laughs> but Emma's question was about... <laughs> Severally in a day, they will carry two or three parts to school and they change themselves. So, if she's using the reusable in the pocket like wrist to support it, how is she going to change? Where will she keep it? And washing, and the same issue of you know, when you wash it, then everybody knows she's in the hand it. If you live in a compound house and you hang your block. Everybody knows, and uh, you know, it's, it's carries on. So you, you may have to pilot it on a small scale before you do it on a large scale. But I'm sorry, I'm very pessimistic about it. People are, are very much in a hurry. And if you have to spend 15 minutes washing this very thoroughly, you need a full bucket of water <laughs> to wash it in areas where they are water stressed. That also becomes another question. Uh -huh. So people are more uh, uh, receptive of 
So, and if it's a public bathhouse, the water, you know, the blood water flows. I mean, I grew up in a compound house and it was a problem. So we either got up very early in our days, we were using the cloth when I, I started mm -hmm. the treaty. Like, you have to bath at dawn because where the water passes, others could see. Mm -hmm. Or you bath late in the evening, so at dawn and in the evening. Otherwise, it was very shameful for us to let others see. So you may have to consider some of this. Okay, it goes into play to how some issues such as the crowds and things. I did like to talk about the reading, I like to read about it. And I realized that it's not only grass that can solve issues of menstrual pains. Sometimes, um, as something little as maybe uh, getting hot water, a towel, putting it in, squeezing and just putting it in, just to soothe the, the pains and look can help. And this is a common thing that. Um, someone in the village can have access to because um, it might prevent the person from going to school but maybe the first day but my little reading tells me that unless I'm wrong the first second day is when there's severe pains that's what I'm saying I'm, and, and there's more flow on the first second day and so maybe on the first second day maybe the first day you have access to your hot water your towel so you bath so you have towel then you can you can use that and I know that there are exercises that one can do to also help because you know you know your body so you should have a fair idea about exactly where the pain is coming from. But sometimes both when they feel the pain it could be in their abdomen, it could be around the thigh region and, and so you should know where you are feeling it and some of the there are some exercises that can help soothe those pains. I think maybe the nurses and um, community um, yes, no, they can help disseminate that information to our younger brothers and sisters and even some of us. <laughs> okay. So I think we can we can say we've come to the end now. Thank you very much all of you. We have had to drag you from your offices at short notice for you to come for this presentation. But we appreciate the comments and the suggestions that you have all made. Thank you. Thank you.